welcome, Jamie, and I really appreciate you giving us um, the, the time today to actually discuss um, your experience in business. And, you know, as, as, as long as it's been um, with OAMPS, it's, um, it'll be interesting to hear um, some of your journey, mate. So tell us a little bit about um, um, what you do and how long you've been doing it. Mate, um, my official role here at the Aboriginal Medical Service is Chief Executive Officer. Uh, I've been doing that since we started in 2005. Uh, so I've been the, the CEO for, this is our 18th year of operation. So um, we provide healthcare to the whole community. We're, we're targeting Aboriginal people uh, because of their health disparity. But our service has always been inclusive, Mark, and I think that's the, the biggest take-home message for us is Inclusion has to happen, uh, one, for sustainability of our organisation, but also about reputation. And uh, I think if we can keep that as at the forefront of any type of work we do as an organisation, then that, that will hold us in good stead. It's held us in good stead for 18 years. So we're in the business of healthcare, mate, and that in every element of healthcare, we're in it. Um, we don't do procedural-based stuff, but we do primary healthcare here. And if I said, um, who's, who's your number one or most important category of client? Or, and again, I suppose that's really challenging to actually define in, in, in this, um, uh, this industry. Um, or who's, what, what group of, um, of people make up your, most of your customers might be a better question. Majority of our uptake is by Aboriginal people, which is an amazing statistic for us, Mark. Um, given our inclusion, we see all people, but we target Aboriginal people and the, recep the reception we get from Orange is, is amazing. The last uh, research project we did on, on uh, the data and the st statistics on, on um, access to our service showed us that 90% of the Aboriginal population come to this service, which is fantastic. Wow. Because you have governments, especially ministers, who aren't really supportive of our um, medical services, question why an Aboriginal medical service should be in a in a location, um, and they always go off the average across the whole country and say that less than fifty percent of Aboriginal populations access an AMS in their respective towns. So our data throws them right out of the water. For us, given in the business of healthcare, Mark, you get a wide range of people coming here. But I'm, I'm encouraged by people that um, have a fear of the health system. Uh, so that may be something negative happened in the past or they think finances or are not sure what healthcare is. It's amazing to me over 18 years that I'm more excited by the people who, who want to be well but don't know how to do it and, and, and where they go, where's their starting point. That's the... That's the encouraging factor for me, that that type of person who has no idea what healthcare is but needs help. And, and I, I, I thrive on that. That's that's what motivates me to do more. And, um, you know, because I'm in the same town as you, I, I see, you know, the, I've seen the growth over the last 18 years and the additional services you, you continue to grow. So um, what what's going on with... You know the, your growth plans for for going forward. What's the what are the next things that are that are in your plans? The most exciting thing that we'll be uh, focusing on. Uh, we're funded until June thirty this year on our current three year contract with Commonwealth and State Health, and in two thousand uh, in Ju July first two thousand twenty three, we'll be kicking off our first four year contract with Commonwealth Health, first time ever. Um, but we've grown the organisation in 18 years from starting with seven staff to um, have a, a range of primary healthcare services, a range of facilities in town. We are a diversified business organisation, Mark. We, we not only provide healthcare. Uh, this, last year, we started uh, running an out-of-home care service here in town. And for the last four years, we've been involved in the NDIS. So we're not just providing healthcare. We're, we're a more diversified organisation now. And that totals about 82 odd staff working for us. Wow. So, so we're growing all the time. In healthcare, mate, you have to have uh, a vision for innovation and, and working outside the square, so to speak, you know, so that 
a lot of people have different um, wants and needs and, and we have to try and accommodate that the best way we can. But we've been growing steadily for the last 18 years and we have a young group of uh, health professionals that work for us now and they want to do more. It, it's amazing when you find people who want to do more. So um, we will be growing even more so in, in the future. One of our really exciting uh, initiatives that we'll start this year, Mark, is we're going to build an hydrotherapy service here. So um, for people who have multiple chronic issues, people who might be obese, people with uh, mental health issues, people who have never done exercise or activity in their life, we're implementing a hydrotherapy service that can do a lot of aqua uh, aerobics, aqua therapy, that will cater from our babies right through um, to our elders in our community. Yeah, wow. And um, obviously um, COVID was really tough for um, the, the whole of the health industry and, and community. Is there, was there anything that, that happened during COVID that you've learned from and, and continue to implement and um, um, going forward? I think the biggest thing we learned through the COVID was our ability to adapt to change. Uh, you know, we, you know, we, we were focused on providing face-to-face -face services to our people all of the time. And when COVID came in with the restrictions and um, wearing um, masks and uh, limiting face-to-face, -face, we had to adapt to a telehealth type of service. Now, th there's, there's pluses and minuses for that. You know, that we can still provide care to people was the plus, but the minus is that we don't get to see our people on a more regular basis. And, and from a, a financial perspective, we weren't able to claim as much money as we would normally do when our clients come into our service. Telehealth has a set rate that you can claim. Um, and so that, that took us uh, back a bit financially, but our ability to, to, to adapt was significant and, and, and that was from the whole team, right? Whether it's um, doctors, nurses, uh, allied health professionals, uh, the only, only clinical team that couldn't do any work was our dentists. <laughs> so they had a bit of a break. <laughs> they can't do telehealth, uh, doing any, any uh, oral health procedures on people on telehealth, mate, that's never gonna happen. So, you know, we, we learned how to adapt to that and our people who, who were, couldn't do telehealth, how they uh, evolved into doing more of our uh, requirements here to keep our organisation open and keep it floating uh, during that period, which was amazing uh, response by our team. Yeah, yeah certainly um, I, I hear that all the time, that the, your ability to adapt was, was um, as a business owner, was how successful you could make it even in um, uh, constricted um, operating um, terms and technologies and all that sort of stuff. So, um, CEO for eighteen years—that's a, a a great um, achievement for you, Jamie. What? And as the CEO, what along the way? What's been your biggest lesson, mate? Uh, I heard this saying a while ago. You know, it, it's I've, I've been inspired by. Um, the health disparity between Aboriginal people and non-Aboriginal people. And, and I personalise it to a point where, you know, that I want to have a quality whole of life. I think everybody has the right to have a whole of, a quality whole of life. Uh, but the cost of living has, has changed dramatically, mate. And, and people are putting their, their own health care um, as a second need. Their, their main need is getting food on the table, roof over their heads clothes on the back and, and trying to survive and the healthcare isn't brought into that um, that picture. So over 18 years, seeing people come to our service, you know, seeing some really good outcomes with people. Um, two years ago, we built a facility uh, that was targeting health and activity for our people and and to, to go up to that building at sometimes through the week or, or going up there to meet new people and I see people there exercising, um, being supported by our team who normally would not do it. That is encouraging for me. Now, it may take a while for them to get the ultimate outcome they want, um, but the output is critical for our people who are unwell. You know, some people, even if they've had, had a procedure at the hospital, go home and 
rehabilitation doesn't happen for them because there's a cost factor and, and people need support. People aren't just going to go to a gym after they've got out of hospital and try to do an exercise or activity program without being supervised and supported. So um, the ad adaptation of our organisation is needs have changed for our people over the last, I think the last 10 years have been critical in change. That it, um, we see a, an increase in chronic illness. We see an increase in mental health conditions and mainly mental health through the, co uh, the pandemic. And we're still seeing the, the impacts of that now. But, you know, when, when you get new staff coming in, we've had, as every other healthcare provider across this country, I'd say, Mark, is we have a, a, a high turnover of staff and, and some of those staff um, have been with us for a while. And, and the model that we've been applying here is that it's not just one person that looks after our clients, it's a range of people. And, and we've, uh, we've adopted that approach because uh, if a GP leaves here and that's all the person sees, then the person feels disconnected. Yeah. But, but when clients come here, Mark, they're seeing four or five different clinicians. So if one of those clinicians leaves, we still got three or four working with this client the client knows them, they know the client, and then they orientate a new person who comes on board. So we don't have a gap in service. We know we're here to try and close the gap, but we don't have a gap in service because of our, our focus being four or five clinicians are working with an individual, not just one-on-one. -on -one. Um, who or what um, is the most inspiring thing um, for you today in how you operate the business? The most inspiring thing to me is that we're, we're, we're growing as an organisation and, and we know, you know that people, a lot of people have wants, but we're here to meet people's needs. We sometimes can meet their wants, um, but if you don't meet their need, then, you know, the last Close the Gap report, Mark, um, didn't paint a good picture of Aboriginal health right across the whole country. But I don't think it's fair when you look at, you know, we've got, 146 AMSs across Australia, 44 in New South Wales, but we've got significant populations that um, don't have the resources, physical or material, to be able to provide the right care to the people that come to us. The majority of our Aboriginal medical services right across this whole central and far west region, we see all people because in some of the smaller communities, Mark, the Aboriginal medical service is the only healthcare provider oh, there. Amazing. And that's, that's significant. Um, one, when we talk about Aboriginal people, about self-determination, ownership, empowerment, when we can provide health care to all people, that is critical for us. Now, don't get me wrong, there are some Aboriginal medical services right across the whole country that only see Aboriginal people, and that's their call. Um, we have a, a, a philosophy here that illness and disease doesn't discriminate, neither should we. And it's worked well for us over 18 years, mate, you know, so... Um, and if you look at our history as Aboriginal people, we're through policy and process and practice, we've been isolated, segregated as people. So why on earth would we practice that? You know, yeah. that, that would be against, for me personally, um, my grandparents and parents always instilled to me to be respectful of all people um, and everybody has their own journey in life. And if we can facilitate some change in that journey that's going to benefit them and their families, why don't we? Yeah. We should not be uh, isolating ourselves from need of people, whether they're black, white, pink or blue, mate. So I'm motivated by new people coming with new ideas. I'm motivated by new um, new practices. I, 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 I'm like a, a sieve, mate. I, I'd like to, I, I don't want to do university again, ever. Um, <laughs> I don't learn that way. I learn from other people. You know, I, I like, as that saying goes, um, fill, um, get people around you who will complete you, not compete with you. Um, so we have great people here in this organisation. We have great partners, not only in Orange, but further afield. And that's been the motivating factor. You know, everybody who works in the health field that I've come across wants to see change. And, and if you're not motivated by change, I say to people, get out. Cool. So um, surrounding yourself with the right um, people, who's been your, um, or might be several people, you're, you have had the biggest impact on you um, to become the CEO you are? 
there's, there's been a range of people, mate. Now, um, now we're happy to say here that we, we've grown a, a lot of young Aboriginal people have come and worked for us and, and they, they've progressed through the organisation into senior manager roles and that's, that's amazing. Um, when you can develop young people um, who come in with not a strong health background but just have a desire to see people living well. And when you see that change, you're, you're motivated by that. And um, as the CEO, you're seen as the leader of the organisation. But I, it takes a lot of people to, to be able to lead others as well because I'm, I'm not a CEO, hands-on CEO. We have uh, great managers here who are uh, younger people who come from different walks of life. They come with different ideas, different aspirations, different motivation, uh, different goals, but they manage to be able to work collectively. And, and that's, that's inspiring for me. Um, I, I've, I remember when we first started this organisation, one of my biggest supporters at that time was uh, the federal member for Kalea, Peter Andron. And, and he was he was an amazing man who, and honestly, without him driving us um, at the federal level, I don't think we would have got the Guernsey to have um, an Aboriginal medical service set up here. So he's been, um, even though he's passed on many years now, the, the early work that he did was motivational. And, you know, when you see the health disparity, and not just um, apart from the Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal health disparity, when people are struggling, you know, and we've seen this right through the pandemic, when people are struggling and can't afford health care, um, it reinforces to me why we're here. And, and, and I think that's, if you're not motivated by that, mate, you know there's something going on. What's the, what's the most significant thing you've learned about yourself um, in the journey of not just the organisation, but the journey of you know, being a CEO of, of, of a very large um, organisation? Being able to let go, mate. <laughs> um, you know, it's when we started this organisation. I was managing six people, and and over the, you know, the if you look at three year periods, we've been changing every three years, and numbers have increased. And um, if you've looked right across this landscape over the last eighteen years, we've had some um, bad outcomes with Aboriginal medical services, and 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 that's because there hasn't been a lot of change internally. Um, I once said to Commonwealth Health and State Health that I don't believe, and I said this, and I don't know why I said it, but I said it to him at a meeting, I don't believe that Aboriginal medical services need chief executive officers. I believe they can run off a um, two senior managers and a role, uh, range of other managers who, who do the operations of this organisation. I don't know why I said it. I might have been thinking of something else, but I said it. I even said it to my board, and, and, and I really... Um, over the last last three years, I'd say, Mark, that it's reinforced to me that you don't really need a CEO to, at an Aboriginal organisation such as ours. And we've got, if you can build a workforce that sees the vision, the goals, the, the, the gains that we make here, and not just the healthcare change, you know, we, we're bringing into this community every three years over $16 million. Now, that's, that's coming in for... Um, people coming to work here, relocating from other places, buying houses, sending their kids to school, spending their money here. Now, we, we've gone from one building to, to have five buildings in town now that we've had uh, modifications, renovations, so we brought in infrastructure funding to this community. And that's something we need to be proud of because um, we, haven't, we haven't seen that happen in a lot of Aboriginal organisations or communities for a long, long time. And, and being sustainable is the number one driving element for us here because this service should be here long, long way after I'm gone, mate. So that, that's our focus here. Again, it sort of leads to the next question. You've mentioned the hydrotherapy pool um, as, you know, um, the next major project. So what does the future look like, in inverted commas? You've, you've, you've basically um, confirmed funding for the next four years. So... And you know, that must much must give you a, a very positive um, feeling to be able to plan for the future. Yeah, mate. Look, we we're going to be one of the major things that we'll do uh, from middle of this year is we're going to be uh, rolling out our first ever ten year strategic plan. Uh -huh. Yeah, that we've never done that. 
I, I, I've spoken to a lot of CEOs across a lot of AMSs um, in our region, but even uh, outside of our region, and nobody's doing 10-year strategic plans in, in our sector. And, and I think that's detriment to us being around here for a long time, because if you look at every Aboriginal health strategic plan from a state perspective or a national perspective, they're mainly 10-year plans. So for us to, to get any traction with um, and get additional funding, whether it's infrastructure or service funding, we have to replicate what they're doing at those levels to say, we have a 10-year plan for Orange. If they've got a 10-year plan across the whole country, across the state, then we need to say, we have the same plan. We want to be here for 10 years plus. We want to be able to implement um, a strong allied health. We want to do more research, and I think that's critical for us. We want to diversify our business even more. Um, our younger people here might just have all these ideas and aspirations. And uh, apart from the, the hydrotherapy, uh, one of the other main things we're looking at is, is aged care and uh, potentially childcare. Yeah. So, um, and, and it's more around providing services that meet the demographic of our community, Mark. It's not, we're not trying to bring in more doctors, more nurses, more dentists. We want to be have, having, able to have a diversified business so that uh, um, our elderly or aging population has access to services and supports, um, that our, our born, our firstborn are able to be able to access childcare that is affordable and uh, effective for them. And then we set them on the right path to have a, a good, long, happy, healthy, quality whole of life. So, um, but it's got to meet in because the, the back, the platform of all of our diversified business is the Aboriginal Medical Service. So we can have um, out of home care, um, NDIS, aged care and childcare, but the sustainability of our medical service is, is the platform. And, and it's worked for us for 18 years and, and we've got uh, aspiration for 10 more years plus that. Um, I don't think I'll be around in 10 more years time, mate. I might be retired playing golf every second day if the boss will allow that to happen. But, you know, um, I'm still actively involved with other committees and, and other organisations and um, sharing what what people need to understand is that you can have a model of care, but if you don't have a model of business, you'll fail. And we've seen that with a lot of our organisations over many years, and not just Aboriginal organisations, but mainstream, where you've got to have a, a business model, Mark, so that it's, it's sustainable. You know, it, it opens up new opportunities for, for our organisation to, where one element that we've never, ever um, looked at is the corporate sector and the philanthropic sector and how we engage with them um, to support us and us to support them. So that's going to be one of the key focuses for us in, in the next 10 years is uh, corporate, philanthropic, growing our diversified business, but making sure that we are sustainable in providing good, effective um, health care to our people. Um, Jamie, it was um, um, great to catch up with you. Really appreciate your time today and to learn a little bit more about um, Orange Aboriginal Medical Service and um, you as its CEO, mate. Um, awesome job to be there for um, all of that growth from seven to 82 staff, mate. You, um, you're to be congratulated, or you and your board are to be congratulated uh, um, for that to be able to happen. So well done, mate. Thanks, mate. Appreciate really it. Really appreciate it.